This year marks the 10th anniversary of Pope Benedict XVI's apostolic and state visit to Great Britain. In this special episode, we'll go through the highlights of the trip, hear from the key people involved in the preparation, and discover how this trip changed hearts. For this and more, Vaticano starts now. Ten years ago in September, Benedict XVI made history, becoming the first ever pope to make an official state visit to the United Kingdom. Monsignor John Armitage was on the preparatory committee that paved the way for his arrival. The run-up was unsure. There was concern among some quarters. Um, there were a number of people who felt that Pope Benedict shouldn't come. Very, very few, but some of those were from the church. And various political groups and social groups also didn't like the idea. It all changed remarkably. And um, it changed when he arrived in Scotland. And the most remarkable gesture, when Her Majesty the Queen sent Prince Philip to meet the Pope. Now, I understand this was the first time in the long history of the reign of this Queen that she sent her husband to the airport to greet um, someone at the airport. And it kind of set a tone Religion has always been a crucial element in na national identity and historical self-consciousness. This has made the relationship between the different faiths a fundamental factor in the necessary cooperation within and between nation states. Today, the United Kingdom strives to be a modern and multicultural society. In this challenging enterprise, may it always maintain its respect for those traditional values and cultural expressions that more aggressive forms of secularism are longer value or even tolerant. As we reflect on the sobering lessons of the atheist extremism of the 20th century, let us never forget how the exclusion of God, religion, and virtue from public life leads ultimately to a truncated vision of man and of society, and thus to a reductive vision of the person and his destiny. Meeting with political, religious, and community leaders from England, Scotland, and Wales, the Roman pontiff highlighted the importance of education and the need to build bridges with all people, regardless of creed, culture, or language. A major highlight of his time in England was the prayer vigil at London's Hyde Park, when the Pope showed thousands of people the core of the Catholic faith. The event itself was truly remarkable for a whole range of reasons. First of all, the enthusiasm of the prize. The people were so excited. And to be in 
the centre of London in Hyde Park on a Saturday evening in total silence with nearly 200,000 people was a moment I will never forget with the Blessed Sacrament there and the Holy Father just leading the prayers. For, for those of us who were there, it was probably one of the great highlights. There was Mass at Westminster Cathedral, which was wonderful. There were various other events. But I think as a moment, a, a, what you might call a golden moment, that was it. Well, in this, this photograph was taken... The man responsible for the liturgy during the papal trip, Monsignor Philip Moger, says that Pope Benedict, during the farewell at the airport, personally thanked him specifically for the preparation of the vigil. And I just said, uh, Philip Moger, responsible for liturgy. And the Pope stopped, looked me straight between the eyes and said, thank you very much, especially for the silence. And I think that that relate to, in the first place, the silences we'd built in to the liturgies, but especially um, the holy hour in Hyde Park the night before, which was incredible to think that there was a blessed sacrament, all these people quietly, and the, the traffic in the distance, but the traffic didn't seem to, um, seem to upset anything. It, it, it gave it a context and uh, so I was, I, was, I was very chuffed, of course, that the Pope said that, uh, but he'd obviously noticed it. The highlight from a political point of view was Pope Benedict's speech in Westminster Hall. Monsignor Armitage was right there with the Pope and British dignitaries throughout the historic visit. Every event was organized by the church and the foreign office because it was a state visit. But one event was just solely the event or the responsibility of the government. And that was the address in Westminster Hall in Parliament. Now, Westminster Hall is one of our, it's where our Parliament began. It's one of the oldest buildings in London. The remarkable historical events have happened there, including the trial of St. Thomas More took place in the hall there. And it's one of the highest privileges that a government can give um, is to invite someone to speak to both Houses of Parliament. To my amazement, I got an invitation to attend, um, completely separate from anything else. So I was very, very privileged to be in Westminster Hall. Um, but immediately after Westminster Hall, there was um, Evensong at Westminster Abbey. And uh, every British Prime Minister who was alive was present. The highlight, of course, was his talk. His talk was stunning. It truly, truly was stunning. As a vision of life and society and politics, i.e. the way we live together, the vision that he gave was as good, I believe, as anything said by any Pope since the beginning of Catholic social teaching. I cannot but voice my concern it's increasing marginalization of religion, particularly of Christianity, that is taking place in some quarters, even in nations which place a great emphasis on tolerance. There are those who would advocate that the voice of religion be silenced, or at least relegated to the purely private sphere. There are those who argue that the pu public celebration of festivals, such as Christmas, should be discouraged in the questionable belief that it might somehow offend those of other religions or none. As he left the Westminster Hall, he stopped halfway down at the spot where St Thomas More sat. And he didn't do anything, he just stood there, closed his eyes for a moment, and then walked out. 
Throughout his visit, Pope Benedict praised British Catholics for the values of tolerance, freedom, and respect, which form the bedrock of democracy in the United Kingdom. Whoever advised the Holy Father advised him very well. It was the anniversary of the Battle of Britain. And for a German pope to talk with such warmth about the anniversary and how the British people had stood up to fascism was touch many, many people. But the core message of Pope Benedict was friendship, intimate friendship with Christ and others that he pronounced during the Mass of Beatification of Cardinal Newman. It had been raining, of course, and the, pe the poor folk who had traveled from early in the morning from all parts of the country got soaked before mass and, and possibly were, felt you know, drenched throughout the mass. But as, as the entrance procession uh, came out of the sacristy and we started seeing praise to the holiest in the height. Although it's a hymn I've grown up with, as all English Catholics have, and, and many who are not Catholic, it, it was as if one was hearing it and singing it for the first time. It was so moving, and that the Holy Father had come to beatify one of, one of our own, John Henry Newman. Cardinal Newman's motto, Cor at cor loquitur, our heart speaks unto heart, gives us an insight into his understanding of the Christian life as a call to holiness, experienced as a profound desire of the human heart to enter into intimate communion with the heart of God. He reminds us that faithfulness to prayer gradually transforms us into the divine likeness. Using the words of the now saint John Henry Newman at the culminating event of his papal visit in 2010, Benedict XVI reminded Catholics of the hidden desire of every human heart to love and be loved by God. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. By visiting Great Britain, Pope Benedict XVI gave a major boost to English Catholics. The visit reinforced the position of Catholics within society, improved the Catholic Church's relationship with the Church of England, and offered the Pope's perspective on the building blocks of a healthy society to the UK. Pope Benedict XVI visited Great Britain in 2010 in the footsteps of his predecessor, St. Pope John Paul II, who made the first ever pastoral trip to Great Britain in 1982. The difference in 2010 is that Benedict XVI had an official invitation from the British government, making it a state visit. Both in 1982 and 2010, the Roman pontiffs met with Queen Elizabeth II, who is the titular head of the Church of England. The English monarchs have held this title since 1536. From conflict to mutual respect and friendship, the relations between the two churches have developed since the break in communion. A remarkable figure of the mutual rapprochement was one of the principal writers and proponents of the Oxford movement, John Henry Newman, later Cardinal Newman. This was, uh, Archbishop Bernard Longley of Birmingham, England, the city forever linked with Cardinal Newman's legacy, calls the Pope's visit providential. With the state visit, um, it meant that there was a real opportunity um, for the Holy Father's teaching ministry uh, to be received much more widely. Uh, 
I remember the days leading up to the visit very, very clearly. Um, particularly, there was a lot of, of interest in, in exploring and discussing uh, scandals within the Catholic Church worldwide, uh, as well as within our own context. Pope Benedict XVI was aware of the issue of sexual abuses committed by clergy and addressed it before the visit in an in-flight press conference. Tristezza anche che l'autorità della Chiesa non era sufficientemente vigilante e non sufficientemente veloce e decisa nel prendere le misure necessarie. Per tutto questo siamo in un momento di penitenza, di umiltà e di rinnovata sincerità. The way that he entered into the visit, um, his gentle humility, but his clarity as well, everything I, I think t t changed for, for us in our experience. And the joy of those four days began to unfold. Pope Benedict XVI headed to some school grounds to speak of the future of England. The student representatives gathered from all Catholic schools of Great Britain. The Holy Father encouraged them to aim high and not to be content with second best, to be friends of God and become saints. He reminded them that God truly desires each of our greatest happiness. God wants your friendship. And once you enter into friendship with God, Everything in your life begins to change. As you come to know him better, you find you want to reflect something of his infinite goodness in your own life. Pope Benedict then moved on to visit the spiritual and political power centers of London. Addressing political and religious leaders, Pope Benedict drew upon the example and witness of several English men venerated as saints worldwide. St. Thomas More gave an example of how politicians can live heroically. They're called to faithfully serve God and others and be martyrs for the truth, showing the proper place of religious belief within the political process. St. Bede, for his writings, was recognized as a doctor of the church. He understood the need for society to uphold tradition while still being open to new developments. Pope Benedict invoked St. Bede's example to inspire Christians to rediscover their shared legacy and to continue their efforts to grow in friendship. St. Edward the Confessor was the great and humble King of England who didn't hesitate to embrace the cross of Christ. The Mass at Westminster Cathedral started with the powerful hymn Tu es Petrus, in English, You are Peter, written by English composer Sir James Macmillan. With this hymn, the congregation proclaimed their loyalty to the Roman pontiff, which in the past was the reason for their persecutions. You are Peter, you are the rock uh, on which I build my church. Uh, it's a a text that is so central to the Catholic understanding of the papacy. Um, and it has, has to be music of an, a, a, a setting of great joy, but also a, 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 a setting of, with music that centers the whole experience of the papacy on what um, Christ's command uh, to his church is all about. So I have a feeling that Pope Benedict, because he is a musician himself, and he loved uh, the musicians of the church, and that love was reciprocated. Uh, that that he, I, I, I would like to think that he would have reacted with uh, delight, um, if, if a little surprise, at the nature of my two S Petrus, which I wrote for him.
Pope Benedict's UK visit culminated with the beatification of Cardinal John Henry Newman. It's fairly rare, I think, for beatifications to be undertaken, especially outside of Rome, uh, by the Pope himself. So this, it made us understand, too, this personal significance of Cardinal Newman in his teaching and his witness uh, to Pope Benedict. By visiting Great Britain, the Holy Father witnessed what Cardinal Newman was preaching, unity in diversity. The best dialogue is when heart speaks unto heart. Uniting Anglicans and Catholics alike around the figure of Cardinal Newman, Benedict XVI reached an entire nation. We'll be back after a short break with more on Vaticano. Looking back 10 years on, Pope Benedict XVI's visit is still quite remarkable for the people who participated in it. A young man discerning his vocation during the time of Pope Benedict's visit had the honor of welcoming the Holy Father on behalf of young Catholics. After giving that, I felt quite emotional. After giving that, I thought that I'd just be able to um, bow, perhaps, and then, and then leave. But I was ushered by one of the guards or something just to you know, go and, and I was able to embrace him. Um, so the impression I had from him was one of like great gentleness. I remember even my face touched his face and it was a real sense of um, um, just something of like a grandfather. Uh, he then went on to ask me about where, um, a little bit about myself. He went on to ask me a bit about myself and again that sense of him being interested in who I was. Uh, he didn't know me from anywhere, but I really felt there was a warmth and a gentleness to, to his character, to his person. And at the beginning of August of this year, then Deacon Pascal Uch was ordained a priest, for which he is also grateful to Benedict. A lot of people wonder if that was the beginning of my vocation story. Um, and in a way, I'm grateful it wasn't. I already had a desire to join the seminary at that time. And in fact, I said to the Holy Father, I said to Pope Benedict, um, I'd like to be a priest. And he responded saying, I'll pray for you. So I look back on that day with great joy because I'm sure his prayers and the prayers of all the church have helped me to, to come to this point. And I'm extremely grateful um, to all that he has gifted us as the church with, be that in his writings, in who he was and who he continues to be for us. Faithful from neighboring countries were also present. Father Martin O'Hagan came with a group of priests from Ireland. He's a member of the renowned singing trio, The Priests, who performed for the Pope in Hyde Park. Well, it was a fantastic honor to sing for uh, Pope Benedict XVI and to, to be in his presence during the papal visit to the UK. We were filled with a sense of excitement, nervous, and yet we entered into the spirit of the prayerfulness and thoroughly gained from that. I think that this was a tremendous boost, tremendous sense of encouragement to the Catholic identity within the UK uh, and I hope that he is at peace in terms of his retirement now uh, in the Vatican and he's still praying for the church.
And there were light moments too. Before the beatification mass at Cofton Park in Birmingham, Archbishop Bernard Longley was able to travel with Pope Benedict XVI inside the Popemobile. I remember him, there were lots of people lining the road. He was in the Popemobile and uh, Pope Benedict was a <laughs> great sense of humor. And uh, there, were, there was a group actually of, uh, of, um, uh, of residents uh, from the Sikh community. Um, and uh, he was delighted to see. Them. So I was able to tell him a little bit about the different faith communities. Uh, and then a group of obviously people who were walking their dogs on a Sunday morning and wanted to. This was a unique moment and they came the Hagley Road and oh, he said they had brought their dogs to see the, the Holy Father. And then he looked, are they Catholic dogs? <laughs> um, so there were, you know, very human and, and touching moments when one could see uh, a little example of how he engaged with people. <laughs> And this is a bit of the story of how the papal trip to Great Britain became a success, in spite of what appeared to be a very complicated situation. The wisdom, humility, and charisma of Pope Benedict XVI reached the people. The German Pope they called rigid turned out to be kind and gentle, and together with his image, the image of the Catholic Church in Great Britain, acquired a new face, the face of Christ that every person and every pontiff in a special way as the Vicar of Christ is called upon to represent on earth.